We got a whole practice midterm to go through today. So, um, very best way to do this is if you have already gone through the practice midterm, so that way you can look at what you've done, you can look at what I've done. I'll also be, you know, I don't wanna just do a midterm in front of everyone that's super boring, so uh, for me as well. So I'm gonna rely on you to tell me what to do. So let's get started. So we have fall 2016, practice midterm exam three. This should be the same thing that's on Blackboard. Always write your name in ASU ID. Right? I'm gonna have, I think that's happened before in the past at least once. Okay, problem one. Following directions. Circle true if the statement is true, or circle false if the statement is false. What happens if you turn in an exam and you didn't circle anything? You're gonna lose however many points this is worth. We will not do an, reach an agreement where you get to choose all true or all false or randomly circle things. That does not work. Okay, so we have to read each of these statements and see if they're true or they're false. On the x86 architecture, the ESP register contains the address of the top of the stack, true or false? True. And I'll probably be looking at this a lot while we're doing this, so if you have a question, I don't know, and I'm not seeing you, say something. Each invocation of a specific function reuses the same function frame. False. This is exactly what function frames in the stack are trying to avoid, right? We saw that we cannot reuse the same function frame for each invocation of a function. The access link is used by the callee to reference the caller's base pointer. What is the access link used for? Which parent? Right, it's used by the callee to reference the caller's base pointer. So the access link, what is the access link used for? When did we learn, look at this? To get the previous function's base pointer. To get, well. Function who called me, I'll get base pointer from it. What are we using it for? What's the point? For, what was that? Somebody say functions? For local functions, right? We wanted to support local functions, so we needed to add another link. So in order to get local functions, you can already look at your callers. You have, when your function is called, you have the caller's base pointer, right? It is saved on the stack at a fixed location. So you can look up the stack of the call chain using that base pointer. The access link is used to reference the lexical parent's base pointer, right? So the lexical scope's base pointer. So this is false. This is also a very tricky worded question. It's also only worth, well, I think it was worth a half point. Lambda x dot x x y is alpha equivalent to lambda z dot z z x. Why? Yeah, the free variable y is different. Address of x equals 10 is a valid statement in c. Why? Yes, um, address of x returns an R value. The whole point of R and L, L comes from it can be on the left of an assignment. Also, L means a box, right? So we have nowhere to put 10. Right? So this is false. It's a lot of falses. In the C decimal calling convention, the callee puts the return value in the EAX register, true or false. In the C decimal calling convention, the caller creates stack space on the stack for local variables. What does the caller create space on the stack for? The parameters, yeah, the parameters, and then the called function saves the base pointer, saves the, um, well, I guess, yeah, saves the base pointer and then creates space for all the local variables. Okay. On the x86 architecture, the location of the current function's frame is stored in EIP. No. What's stored in EIP? The next, the next instruction to execute is the instruction pointer. The program x 
bracket y plus y bracket x type checks correctly using Hindley Milner type checking. Y false. Right, based on this, y has to be an int, and x is an array of something. And here, we're trying to access y as if it was an array, but it, we just said it's an int. It can't be both an int and an array. And so this does not type check. In the C double calling convention, the caller pushes the arguments onto the stack. True. Stack allocation is automatically deallocated in C. True. When does this happen? End of scope. End of scope. Yes. Cool. How's that? Easy? Hard? Both? All of the above? You at least have a 50 50 shot on these, right? Yeah. Better than other ones. Okay. Professor? Yes. Uh, if you are not doing a function call, but you're just doing like brackets in C to make a, a local scope, is there a frame created for that? Or is it just you use, use the same frame as the function set? It's a good question. I think that would depend on the compiler. I think. Huh. I think those are mostly on the scoping rules in C. So you need to know that this declaration of this, so let's say we have like a, um, so we're saying we have like main, we have like int x, x equals 10. And then here, then in here we have int uh, x equals 100. And we have like a print x, and then a print x. I know these prints aren't actual things, right? So this is kind of the question is what happens here. So it could create a function frame here. The compiler also knows just by looking at this function main how many, how much total variables it needs. So it could create all that local space there. And so it could say, give this one EDP minus four. And this one it could say is at EBP, EBP minus eight. And then because it knows, right, the scoping will say print out this X, this will print out EBP minus eight. And this will print out EBP minus four. So there's gonna be no things there. It could do it that way, or it could create a whole stack frame for it. I don't know exactly how GCC does it. It's That'd like be. writing loops in your function. So we, we don't create uh, separate function frame for loops. Correct. It does not for a while loop or a for loop. Just a local variables. The compiler knows. Yeah, I think that's probably true then. That was a good that'd be a good argument. Yeah. So like if you do it in a while loop, if you just declare variables in there, it's not going to create a whole function frame there. So coalesce them all into one function frame. Hmm. Interesting. Cool. Any other questions? Alright. Problem two. Consider the following code in C syntax. So we have code here. Now, the first thing we want to do is we're going to go and read the actual instructions. Right? We don't want to just consider the code without knowing what we're considering it for. Draw the program stack. So we got to we have to draw something. Draw program stack at the first execution of location one, which is specified as a comment. For some reason, I cannot draw straight lines. Sorry. Uh, label on the stack. All, so this is what we have to do. We have to, you know what? Oh, um, well, there we go. Okay, draw the function stack at the first execution of location one. We need to label all function frames. And inside each function frame, label the parameters to the function, the value of those parameters, the function's local variables, and the value of those local variables. Right, so we're gonna make sure we're hitting all of these things. Next, something that's so important, it's not, it is italicized. You do not need to follow precise C decimal calling conventions. This means the or specific order you write of the arguments doesn't matter. Uh, I also am fine, well, we don't do it this way, but I guess if your arguments are interspersed with your local variables, that is kind of fine too, but it's really dirty, so I would not do that. Uh, the next line is also important. Assume static scoping and pass by value semantics. Right, so this is how we know how we look up variables and everything. Okay, uh, also, sorry, quick side note. Uh, 
this will already be online by the time this posts. I had questions about this in office hours, so I went through practice, no, no, I went through fall 2015, midterm two, this question, and the pass by value question. So I recorded those, I haven't posted them yet, but they'll get posted later today. Okay, so we have some code here. We see location one, so we want to say, when this executes, what's the stack look like? Where do we start? So then what's the first function frame that's going to be on our stack? Main. And remember, we are writing our, our stacks so they start at high memory and go down. You're a bad person if you draw them the other way. It's not true, but draw them from the correct way. You got to think from our perspective. It's going to be way easier to grade if everyone's looks exactly the same. If you start doing it other ways, uh, we have problems. Okay, so what do we have to do here? We look at the instructions. It says, okay, we just labeled the function frame, and inside each function frame, label the parameters of the function, the value of those parameters, the function's local variables, and the value of those variables. Cool. So, do we have any parameters to main? Do we have any local variables to main? Yes, one labeled x, and what's the value of x? Zero. Cool. So we basically did this first one, right? We said x equals zero. Now we're here at this line, we're going to call foo x. So now what happens to our stack? Do we not need to include the addresses or? Uh, label the parameters and the values of those parameters, the local variables and the values. So yeah, you only need to do the name and the value. Cool. Okay, so what happens next to our stack? Right, we're going to push on a new function frame for foo, and so what values is that going to have? Or what, what parameters does it have? Why? And what's the value of y? Zero. Zero. Zero, based on this call. And does this have any local variables? I. What's the value of i? 10. Cool. And this whole thing is foo. Right? So we set i equal to 10. And then here we check, is y 0? Yeah, then what happens? We're now going to call foo. So what are we passing in? So now we're going to create what on the stack? How does our stack change? A new function frame foo. Ah. Surprisingly difficult. So we already know from this other one that we have a parameter y and a local variable i. And so what is the value of this invocation? So now we're here. What's the value of this invocation? Y is 1. Y is 1. And then i is going to be 10. Then we check, is y 0? No. Then what are we returning? i plus y, which is 11. And where are we putting that? So this will be 11. Right? So this foo is going to return. So now everything here is gone. Right? This return, the function return, that function gets automatically deallocated. It's on the stack. We set the return value here to be 11. Is that right? Yeah. So on the exam, do we need to erase it or cross it out? <laughs> what does the question say? Does the question say draw the entire history of this stack up until at location one? It says draw the program stack at the first execution of location one. Is crossing it out okay? I don't know. That's a little, a little sketchy. <laughs> It's not really clear what you mean when you like 
it, okay, if you did that and then wrote next to it with an arrow, like automatically deallocated or something, that I guess would be fine. But otherwise, it's not entirely clear what you mean. Did you just mess up and so that is now no longer part of the stack or is it actually deallocated? I mean, the point is that that's no longer there, right? We don't care about it anymore. That's why I erase it. Um, so you can do like a little try, you know, lots of scratch paper. So you can try it on scratch paper, get to a point, copy it over. We'll have time for that, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> So then we get here, and we call bar. So what happens to our stack? New frame. This is going to be bar. Cool. So what are the variables that we have? Yeah, A and B. Right? And so what's the value of A? Zero. That's why I'm saying the order does not matter of these. Yes, it would be B and A, but we can draw like this. It's fine. OK, B. So what's the value of B? 11. And then we hit location 1. So we're done. So here, 
is where things change, right? I am passing by value. So now I want to figure out the output of this program. So we look at foo. And so for foo, how am I going to draw box circle diagrams for the parameters and the local variables? New boxes. Yeah, new boxes, new box circle diagrams, right? So I have A, I'm going to have C, I'll have X, and I'll have Y. Okay, so what's going to be the value inside A? One. And the value inside C? One. Cool. And I say X is equal to A plus C. What's going to be inside X? Two. Look at this difficult math. A is equal to A plus one. Y is equal to C. C is equal to y plus 1. Cool. And then this returns. We get here. So what happens to my box circle diagrams? These all go away. Right? These are all automatically deallocated. Right? Now I print out. So I'm printing out x dash a0 dash a1 dash a2 so it's x done look at that i was dusting my hands off we can clap later at the end when we finish. right this should be the easy one right and you're at the level now where you should be able to understand and simulate the execution of C code that you're given. Right? So you got to think these questions are testing two things. Uh, similarly, actually, with the previous question, right? If you don't understand what happens with function calls and returning values from functions, you will struggle with this, even if you understand the function frames. But you're at the level where you should be able to give you some code and tell me what the output is and be able to tell me all the functions that are output and all the values of all the variables. So the same thing here. Cool. So this one should be a freebie, right? Pass by value. So this is what you do every day. All right. Pass by reference. Where do things change in this program when I'm executing main? Over here, right? So we know that it's only pass all these passing semantics, right? Only change how we invoke functions. So we know that everything's the same up until here. So we'll still have x with the location one. We still have a which has the memory address of some alpha, and then we have alpha that has the 0, 1, 2 array. Good? Cool. Now I call this function foo, now what happens? So now I have a and c, and what happens here? Yeah, a is bound to the same location as x. Which now that I write it there, I realize that's terrible. I'll go here, well, I'm gonna call this a foo to separate this from a main. Right? And I'm going to say that a foo is bound to the same location as x. So what about c? Yeah, so it's technically bound to this thing. Right? Okay, now we're in foo. Now we have local variables x and y. What are they bound to? New boxes. I'm going to add f's here so we know that those are f's and this is an m for me. Cool. Okay, now we do x is equal to a plus c. So A in foo is 1, and C is 1. 1 plus 1 is? And we put that in x foo. A is equal to A plus 1. So we have A foo is 1, plus 1 is 2, 
Copy that into a foo. This is going to be 2. Y is equal to C. So here we have C foo, which is 1. And we're going to copy that into Y foo, which is here. This will be 1. And then we set C is equal to Y plus 1. So we take Y foo, which is 1. We add 1 to it, which is 2. And we're going to change C. So this is going to change. And then we return. So what happens to my all of my foo variables? Right, all the names go away, and the lo the names of the parameters go away, but the names of the local variables and their boxes go away. So you can I do this? I'm gonna make this long. So good. Okay. So, if the parameters are passed by reference, the output of this program is 20222. Two, two, two. Everybody agree? Cool. Questions on this? Pass by value, pass by reference? program, right? So I have my x main, I have a main, 
and I'm going to have two new variables, x foo and y foo. So I'll draw them up here. And I'm going to go through and execute this. So I have x foo is equal to x main, which is 1, plus a main of x main. So a main is here. X main of 1 is 1. So I'm going to add 1 plus 1 and add 2 into x foo. Right. Then I take x main and I'm going to increment it by 1. So x main is now going to be 2. Then the next line, I'm going to get a main of x main. So what's that going to return? Foo. And store that into y foo. Then I set f a main of x main is equal to y foo plus 1. So what's y foo plus 1? 2 plus 1 is 3. Basic skills. A main x. So which x main right now? 2. So this is going to change this to 3. And so when this returns, right, all of this goes away. And this is going to output what? This is hard to do just by looking at it. Super easy to make mistakes. And when you just write down something that's wrong, it's wrong, right? Cool. Questions on this? An interesting thing to think about while you're studying that can maybe help you develop some intuition for this past my name is why was this different than the reference one? Right? What about function food made it different? Yes? Uh, so in past my name, do we assume that uh, it is dynamic scoping? There's no dynamic scoping. Because you are replacing this expression. Yes. This expression statically, this a maps to this a, and this x maps to this x. Right? So you're saying that every time I want c, I want what's a, x in this scope. You're not dynamically looking up a or c. If you were doing that, dynamically looking up x here, you would get this x. Right? Because you would get it from this local scope. You're essentially capturing the scope of where those are used in the invocation. And then in the body when they're used, that's the scope that you use. It'd be like replacing foo here in essence by replacing a and c with a. And then you have to deal with the variables, so that gets hard to think about. But that's basically the way to think about it, is you're capturing when you, this is invoked, what is this ax referred to? And what does a refer to and what does x refer to? Every time this variable is used, you reevaluate this a bracket x. Cool. Any other questions on this one? So there'll be another review I did of this one in office hours. I think it'll be helpful too. So I think it's a trickier question, maybe. I don't know, they're all tricky. All right. Lambda calculus. So okay, we've only used 30 minutes of our time. And we're talking. Okay. Problem four. Fully parenthesize the following lambda expressions. What do we use to fully parenthesize these? Obviously parentheses. <laughs> How do we, sorry, that's my fault. How do we know where to put these new parentheses? Yes, but what are all those instances of? Our disambiguation rules. We have disambiguation rules, right? So we're going to add parentheses so that this expression is no longer ambiguous. All right. So at a high level, right? So we have application, 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 and application here. 
inside parentheses, and then inside here we have application, 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 right? So we have to disambiguate several different things, right? Inside this parentheses, we have to disambiguate here. So notice when we left associative, so we're going to have that happen first. Good? Awesome. Now inside here, we have the same thing. We now have, we have, you can think of this, you have to think of this whole thing, because it's a parentheses, as its own lambda expression, right? <laughs> so we're going to, is that a question? Okay. Parentheses. First this, then this, then that whole thing. Questions? Do we need the last parentheses? I don't think so. Is it wrong if you have the? No. Okay. It's the same. There's no disambiguation here. Well, which one is the last parentheses that hmm? you asked about? The last ones, these ones. Oh, the whole thing? Okay. Yeah. Personal preference, but I thought I could explain better why we were going inside here. Because of the parentheses outside, right? We have to treat that as its own expression. So this is going to be parsed as one expression. And so we need to go inside of it. It's totally acceptable. Think about it this way. And then you don't need one on the outside. But then Any questions on that? Sweet. All right. Fully parenthesized. Hold on. Fully parenthesized the following lambda, the following lambda expressions. Okay. So in a similar vein, we can just look just inside these parentheses that are already here. Right. We know this is going to be a lambda expression on its own, so we can disambiguate this one first. So what's our rule about? Uh, bodies, function, abstraction bodies. So from here all the way to the end, is AX ambiguous at all? No. There's only one way to parse that. Cool. Now we have, now we can treat this as lambda expression, lambda y dot x a y z. Right? So we can treat this as its own expression. So now the question is, what do we do here, right? So how do we deal with the ambiguity of the body? Now what do we do for the body on the inside? Left associative, yeah. So we first are going to do xa, and then that applied to y, and we do not need the last one. Now. Is this ambiguous? Yes. Do we need to add this? Yes. Yes. Okay, you can add them, but we've already added this body, right? So lambda meta variable lambda id dot lambda expression is an expression, right? Yes. So this is going to get parsed as an expression. We have an application with this expression on the left and this expression on the right. So you can add, you can add more. Don't get too crazy because you still have to read these things, right? Cool. Questions on this? So this part is critical. I know this seems very simple, right? But if you can't do this one, 100% cold, right, every single time, then if you fail doing this on two and three, the other lambda calculus questions, then you're never going to get those right. Right, so this is a foundational thing where if you can't do this, you really can't do anything else. Okay, circle all three variables in the following expressions. Done. <laughs> yes, that's how you get minus points for circling non-free variables, right? 
It also doesn't say what will happen if you do circle the non-free variables. So I'm telling you up front, don't be surprised. OK. So we have lambda x dot, and then we have this body. So inside of here, which variables will be bound? X. So all the x's in here are going to be bound. So this is bound, bound. Uh, that's a meta variable. Bound, bound. Then inside here, what variable are going to be bound? X. So this x is bound, so that means when we get to this y, what is it? It's a free variable. You're getting a variable. You're getting a variable. I gotta zoom in a little bit more. Okay. Now circle all the free variables in here. So inside here, which variables are gonna be bound? X and Y, which means the Z is free. And inside here, we have Z and X will be bound. Right? So X is bound and Z is bound, but Y is now free. Yes, you should circle both of them. <laughs> so circle all. Oh, if you did one circle? That would be, that's fine. Oh, sorry. Yes. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's, all right, you got the idea. I, I literally can't do that. I'm just going to do it. Okay, problem five. Write the result of the relay. Write the result of the rename operation below the lambda expression. So here we have the lambda expression x, y, z, and then parentheses x, y, z. And we are substituting x with z in here. What's the result of this going to be? Z, y, z. Do you have to add the extra disambiguation rules here? No, because that's why our they are our disambiguation rules, because we know that's exactly what they mean, right? When we write x, y, z space parentheses x, y, z, we know how to parse that, right? We know how to add the disambiguation rules to it. And now I have to rewrite this. Yes, question. You've shown the rename in both directions. Which should actually be for others? <laughs> what? Replacing z with x. Oh, did I do it the other way? Yeah. That's your fault, not mine. <laughs> I blindly wrote down what you said. <laughs> yes, replace Z with X. Okay, X, Y, X. X, Y, X. That would also be something that's important to memorize. Yes. Also, don't listen to a class telling you what something is. It took a long time for somebody to raise their hand, by the way. Okay. What is the case when you have to rename the matching variables that are bound? It's going to be down here. Okay. Yeah. This is you blind, right? This is a blind replace. Replace all X, Zs with Xs. And here we're going to replace all A's with foo. So this is going to be lambda x dot foo x, lambda y dot x foo y z. And if we really wanted to be super precise, right, we would write out the application of this to each side, and we would do it step by step. Depends on how confident you are in your substitution operations. Can you scroll just a little bit? It'll be recorded. <laughs> Got it? Got it? Okay. Uh, write the result of the substitution operation below the lambda expression. So here we have the lambda expression x applied to lambda x dot x y and x. Substituting x for lambda y dot y. Right. So, are there any free variables in the expression that we are substituting? Yes. Oh no. no, no, no. <laughs> Do we need to go back to the free variable section? And go to this again? Okay. 
There are not any free variables in what we're trying to replace, which means that we don't have to care about that weird rule of if there are free variables in doing the renaming operation. Substitution operation, right? This rule here. So if we're trying to rename something where the meta variable is free in n, then we have to rename that expression. So let's look at this. Let's just look at this. So here, we can do this step by step. So we first have x, and we're replacing x with lambda y dot y based on the rules that we have here. So this is an application, so we are simply distributing this to each, every side of the application. Here we have lambda x dot x y, where we are replacing x with lambda y dot y. And then on the right, we have another x here. We're substituting x for lambda y dot y. OK, we do this. What's this going to return? Lambda y dot y. And this, the same thing, right? This rule uh, right here, right? If we're trying to re replace, substitute something that is the meta variable is the same that we're trying to replace, you can think of it that it cards it, right? So we don't want to replace any of those x's in here. So this is going to be lambda x dot x y. And this is going to be lambda y dot y. So is this my answer? Did you say that one more time? Why can't you replace it? Here? Yeah. This is rule, this rule here, where we have a case where we have lambda x dot e, right? And this meta variable is the same as the meta variable, is the same as the meta variable we're trying to replace. So here we're trying to replace this id x with some name. And so you can think of it as this guards it, right? So we don't want to replace the x in here because this x is bound here. The substitution operation, we want to replace all three x's with the expression. Yes? I don't think so. That's something you'd know. No. It's important to lay the guy goes, so. Okay, so back to my question. Is this correct? Why? Yes, because this is what this means, right? Right? This is not what we had. So this x, right, we replaced it, is going to have to be its own thing. This already had parentheses around it, so it will continue. And this x is also its own thing. Is this OK? Oh. Yeah. Yes. 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 Because this is exactly what we gave it, right? Yeah. We don't need to add the disambiguating parentheses, because we know how to do that. The important point is that this structure is maintained, right? When you replace this x with some arbitrary lambda expression, it better not change the parsing of the original instruction. Right? This is very key. OK, let's go through this example. So here we have, we're replacing x with lambda z dot lambda x dot x y y z in lambda y dot x y y z. Fun fact, if you look. Wait, where's that? That's this. We're doing this function application. We're replacing the x in here with lambda z dot x, x, y, y, z. We're replacing all the x's in the body with that. Just a little Easter egg bonus. That is no points. OK. So what is this saying? We're trying to replace all three x's with this lambda expression. So what are the three variables in this lambda expression? Y. So y is free in here. And so we have a situation where we are trying to substitute. So we have here, we have y. And we're not trying to substitute for y. So we're trying to substitute for x. So these are different. But y is a free variable in n, in the lambda expression that we're trying to replace. Which means that if we were to just replace x in here, right, this y that here is free would now be bound to this y, which we do not want to happen. So what do we do? 
replace the meta variable in here with something else. What do you want? W. W. Can we use X? Can we use Z? No, because they appear in both these things. So let's use W. So you would do this operation. You would um, replace Y with W. We know the result, and then you'd have this bracket thing here. Sorry, I'm going fast because we're out of time. Um, but we'd get lambda w dot x w w z. Substitute x in for this thing. We'll call it n. So we do that. We can drop that just indirectly. We have uh, lambda w dot x w w z x replaced with n. And then that would distribute to all of them. We know it's going to change this one. So we will have lambda w dot. Uh, let's see, was this lambda z dot lambda x dot x y y z w w z? There you go. We need we act so we can't leave it like this. This is not correct. We change the entire text. We change how we're parsing this body exactly. So we need this body. So now it's still in the form lambda w dot one two three four the application. This z is bound to this z. This z is a free z, just like it was before. That's important. Oh yeah, uh, possibly, yeah. The Hindley Milner and the box circle diagrams were the worst of midterm three, so there was already Hindley Milner problems on here, as we saw, right? So don't be surprised.